Every year, thousands of experts evaluate the status of animal, plant, algae, and fungi species around the world. Using a common language of assessment, they categorize each species' risk of extinction on the IUCN Red List. The Red List provides a barometer of life. And every year, the outlook gets worse. More than 31,000 species are currently threatened with extinction. Most because of human action. But human action can also reverse the Red List trend. So conservationists, governments, and communities around the world are joining forces, activating tried and tested IUCN tools in a coordinated effort to assess, plan, and act for wildlife. Together, we can save species from extinction. Together, we can win the fight for our planet's future. Together, we can reverse the red. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to all of you all around the world. And it's my great pleasure to welcome you to the second Reverse the Red webinar, where we're going to continue to explore this really tricky question of what can we do to reverse the trends that we see in species conservation right around the globe. I'm Jenny Gray, I'm the Chief Executive Officer of Zoos Victoria and the immediate past president of the World Association of Zoos and Aquariums. I'd like to open by paying my respect to the traditional owners of the land on which we all gather. I'm joining you from Melbourne in Australia, the land of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, and I pay my respects to elders past and present. The red listing of species is a process carried out by scientists around the world, giving common language to how species are faring. The best outcome is if you get listed as least concerned. That means we don't lose sleep over you. We don't worry about how you're going. And of course, the worst is extinct. It's when we've lost an entire species forever and nothing we can do will bring them back. Mary Midgley calls that a great evil. And I think that's just such a truism. Unfortunately, each time we assess species, we find a concerning trend that they're getting worse. They're not moving towards least concern, they're moving towards extinction. The recently released Global Biodiversity Outlook shows that the red list has deteriorated by 9% over the last 10 years. The 10 years when we all focused on changing this. Today, I'm joined by an interesting panel of people with significant experience um, and in leadership and conservation and in addressing this question. The format is gonna be a chat, a fireside chat, and we all lamented that this is not in person with a glass of wine. Uh, and as we go through this, I'm going to be encouraging you to contribute as well, to get involved either through the chat or through the Mentimeters that we'll put up from time to time. I'd like to start with a quote from the first woman, African woman to win the Nobel Prize, Kenyan Wangari Mantai. She says, today we're faced with a challenge that calls for a shift in our thinking so that humanity stops threatening its life support system. We are called to assist the earth to heal her wounds and in the process to heal our own. Indeed, to embrace the whole of creation in all its diversity, beauty, and wonder. It's my great pleasure to introduce the people who are going to be exploring the beauty and wonder of the strange little blue planet that we exist, that we occupy. And as you meet them, I'd like to hear from all of you. Where are you? Where in the world are you joining us from today? Um, joining us from New York is John Robinson, 
John has worked for 30 years with Wildlife Conservation Society and our dear colleagues at the Bronx Zoo, where he occupies the Joan L. Tweedy Chair in Conservation Strategy. John studied primate behavior and ecology. He's been recognized globally for his work in conservation and has served on the steering committee of the SSC, the traffic board, and as IUCN counselor. From Zambia, but based in the US, is Brighton Coma. Brighton is a social entrepreneur and climate activist. Frustrated by widespread inaction on climate and ecological crises, he invented a radio model at the age of 14 and mobilized over 2 million weekly radio listeners on the Copper Belt province in Zambia. He believes in the power of, empower, in the power of empower, empowered young people as a force for economic and social transformation. And, and Brighton, I was also delighted to see that BuzzFeed named you as one of the badass young people making the world a better place. Great title. From Uganda, Dr. Gladys Kalema Zikusa, who is founder and CEO of Conservation Through Public Health, an award-winning NGO that protects endangered gorillas and other wildlife through One Health approaches. In 1996, she established the Uganda Wildlife Authority's first veterinary department. In 2015, she founded Gorilla Conservation Coffee to support farmers living around the habitats where gorillas are found. Widely recognized for her work, Dr. Gladys holds a number of leadership roles related to primates, women in leadership, and wildlife authorities. From Germany, showing just how global we are, we have Melanie Virtue. Melanie is head of aquatic species team at the Convention on Migratory Species. Her team is responsible for marine and fresh water species from whales to turtles to sharks and sturgeons. Melanie has been working with the UN for 27 years and has focused her attention on species conservation for 20 of those years. And before joining CMS, she worked at UNEP headquartered in Nairobi where she coordinated the Great Ape Survival Partnership. And finally, joining us from Australia is Dr. Sally Box, the Australian Threatened Species Commissioner. The Threatened Species Commissioner champions the implementation of threatened species strategy and practical conservation actions to recover our most threatened plants and animals using principles of science, action, and partnership. Sally has a PhD in plant sciences and began her career working on threatened species assessments. What an amazing group of people. And I, I really am delighted that you could all join us. In preparing for tonight, we asked each of our species about our panel about their favorite species, because we really want to bring species into this discussion. That's what this is all about. And at the same time, while the panel shares with us what their favorite species are, we're asking you, the audience, to have a look. There's a link within the chat, which will be a Mentimeter chat. That will enable you, the audience, to also enter what your favorite species are. And we'll have a look at that after we've heard from our panel. And I'm going to ask John to kick us off tonight. John, you're going to start us off with a South American primate that I'm sure is going to be a firm favorite. Tell us a little bit about your favorite species. Um, thank you, Jenny. Um, it's always a difficult question, actually, which is your favorite species. but. But I chose the wedge cap capuchin monkey because I worked with it for uh, 14 years in, in Venezuela. Um, I followed a population of about 250 animals um, over that period. Um, and what, what, what I found working with them was they really introduced me to the sort of the whole rich complexity of a tropical forest. They were individualistic, they had great personalities. Um, but they also taught me something about conservation. Um, most of the capuchin monkeys are not on the red list. Um, the species occur really throughout the neotropics. Um, but species conservation is also about preserving naturally occurring populations of common species. And the capuchins are um, architects, they're, they're seed dispersers, they're fruit eaters. Uh, they make the forest go round. Um, and it's species like capuchins that provide the ecosystem services. People depend on them for food and shelter. 
um, and they are the most immediate um, victims of habitat loss and fragmentation and degradation. So a lesson that I learned was the reason for conserving species is more than just seeking to avoid their extinction. We don't want to lose species. Extinction is forever. Um, but, but we don't just want to worry about vulnerable species. Reversing the red also means keeping species at naturally occurring levels in the ecosystems where they live. In other words, we also have to recognize the green. That's absolutely right. Thank you, John. And, and you're right. It's not just about waiting until it's too late. Melanie, you're going to take us underwater, which seems appropriate for your backdrop. Um, but the species you've chosen is maybe not quite as charismatic as the sharks. Yes, I thought we couldn't have only very charismatic primates um, on this today. And so I thought I would take the European eel, which is one of the, actually the most fascinating um, species. It has one of the largest migrations in the world, or the most diverse from the high seas um, in the Atlantic and the Sargasso Sea. The young um, uh, eels make their way right across to the European um, to coastline um, to the beaches, into estuaries, up the rivers, and into lakes, even up into landlocked countries, um, as well, of course, as into the Baltic and Mediterranean seas. Uh, there they spend their entire lives growing, and then they make their way as, as, as adults all the way back out to sea to breed and then to die. Um, so a huge number of different habitats that they occupy, uh, pass through, and are exposed to threats, and uh, which does make them particularly vulnerable. But it also makes them really interesting and it makes them also really quite hard to study. The, um, the spawning in the Sargasso Sea has basically never been properly witnessed, but this is what you know, we assume happens based on what we, what we see. And, and the other thing about them that, that always staggers me, and especially as someone who used to work on primates, is that the species is critically endangered and yet it's still treated as commercial fish. You can eat them. Um, in Germany here, I can buy smoked eel of a critically endangered species, and that always somehow surprises me. Um, and of course, as they go along, they, they face so many different threats. Um, you know, one of the uh, ones that have been around for quite a while now is hydro dams. So the eels try to make their way up rivers. There's now hydro dams on almost all of the, the big rivers in Europe and or other barriers. And so how, how do the eels get up? Well, sometimes you can build fish ladders so that the eels can get up to the lakes. But then um, when they're now mature animals wanting to breed, they have to come back down. And there's no fish ladders to come back down. There's hydro turbines. And these eels are you know, over a meter long and don't usually make it through turbines in one piece, unfortunately. And because, as I said, they only breed at the end of their life, times, if they don't make it successfully all the way back to the Sargasso Sea, this animal will have never bred in its lifetime. And But but now the biggest threat um, actually is illegal trade. Uh, it's impossible to breed them in captivity, but yet they're a delicacy in many parts of the world, um, but particularly in Asia. And so there's a lot of illegal trade of taking animals in from the coastlines of Europe and sending them to, to Asia. Um, this trade is considered to be worth perhaps $3 billion a year. It's certainly the biggest wildlife crime in Europe, um, if not in the world. And it's quite difficult to deal with because you know Europe, the European Union has um, um, stopped all legal trade, but other species of angular eels that, especially in their juvenile forms, look, look very similar, um, are still legal to be traded. And so, when they're stopped in transit, it can be very difficult to identify the species. So the four eels, there's a lot going on, uh, but I do think that they exemplify sort of migration at its most diverse, but also the, the threats to um, these critically endangered species that are so varied. Thank you, Melanie, and, and really bringing home to us the diversity of both their habitats and yet the extreme threats. You know, we often think that animals that are versatile will do better than animals that are specialists. Um, and I think maybe it's a shout out to all my aquarium colleagues to say we need better profile for eels. 
Now, Brighton, your species has a great profile. In fact, I think a fact that not many people know is these guys are the number one most popular animals by number of zoos displaying them. We absolutely love these guys along with you. So tell us a bit about your species, Brighton. I, I, I think they, uh, first of all, they're extremely beautiful. Uh, and the moment I was asked about the question of indicating what my favorite species is, uh, of course, the ring-tailed lemma came to mind, uh, primarily because a few days back we were celebrating Wild Lemma Day, um, which is critical. Uh, and I remember writing a, a, a blog about it, about why this, is, this species is relevant and why we need to protect it. And uh, as you might already know, almost a third of lemma species in Madagascar are now critically endangered, quite endangered. Um, and just like a couple of steps away from uh, extinction. Uh, one thing that is unique about them is that, and it's like a fun fact, their, um, their, their tails are longer than their bodies. And uh, when I discovered that, I realized that they were quite a unique species. But also, most importantly, I realized that their body itself signifies something quite critical in conservation. And I would want to link this to how long their tails are. At a point like this, when we need to reverse the red, we need to recover from the current uh, COVID pandemic. I believe we need to think about very long lasting interventions. And I think those interventions should be longer than the tail of a llama. And this requires <laughs> us to start thinking critically about what those long-term plans look like. How can we be able to create a world where uh, humans exist in harmony with nature? And what are some of the long-term sustainable uh, approaches that we need to start taking agently? Thank you. I, I love that, long-tailed answers. Now, Gladys, your favorites are bigger and more endangered and I think if we make it long-tailed let's make it as powerful as these guys. Tell us a little bit about the animals that you've been helping protect. Sorry Gladys you're going to have to come off mute. <laughs> Yes. Hi. Um, yeah, thank you. Yes, well, my uh, favorite animals are the gorillas. I didn't specify which subspecies. <laughs> but I've been working with us, um, starting off as a vet student and now, you know, working with them in different ways, improving their health and also their conservation, working closely with communities. I would say that the greatest threat to gorillas in the whole of Africa is still habitat loss. Um, unfortunately, most of the time, most of the places where gorillas are found, there's a very high human population growth or population density, and which places them at great risk because their habitat is being destroyed or it can't expand. And that is the case for all of them. The mountain which I've worked with for most of the time and also the other gorilla subspecies. Um, another big problem is poaching. Um, in, Af in Uganda and Rwanda, uh, people don't eat primates typically. So the problem is not poaching for gorillas, but it's poaching for other animals in the forest like dika and bush pig, when they get caught in snares or accidentally get speared. And, but in all the other parts of Africa, people do eat primates. And so bush meat is still a big issue. Poaching is a big one. And then disease is a very big one because we share over 98% genetic material and can easily make each other sick. And once you habituate gorillas for tourism or research, um, you put them at greater risk of being in close contact with people who can make them sick. And so, especially now during COVID-19, it's something that is a very big cause of concern for us. And, but unfortunately, we find that when you habituate gorillas, you, they lose their fear of people, they get closer to people, but it's created an opportunity to protect them because people pay a lot of money to visit. And once they visit them, some of the money is shared with 
the local communities so they learn to coexist with the gorillas, which has really happened in the case of the mountain gorilla. And this is why, although the Western lowland gorillas are decreasing in number, and so are the Eastern lowland and the Cross River gorillas, the mountain gorillas is the only gorilla subspecies that's increasing in number. So it's moving from critically endangered to endangered in 2018. So since I first started working with the gorillas, the numbers have increased from 600 to 1,063. And we're, with the mountain gorillas have increased. So we're really pleased about that. And we know we need to reverse the red in all the other, the Western gorilla and other gorilla subspecies. But I'm glad that with the mountain gorilla, we've started to reverse the red. And we hope you keep doing that in spite of the COVID-19 pandemic where tourism has reduced drastically and poaching has gone up. Thank you, Gladys, and, and so many critical issues for these amazing gorillas. Sally, you bringing us in last, but you bringing plants into the room. People forget about that. Do you want to introduce this beautiful plant? Thanks, Jenny. Well, um, I'm often asked in Australia what my favourite species is, and as Threatened Species Commissioner, I always say that I'm not allowed to have favourites, but uh, Jenny really twisted my arm and said, no, 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 you must have a, must have a favourite. Um, for, for this webinar. So I've chosen the matchstick banksia, um, which is uh, endangered in Australia. It's um, one of our, uh, listed as one of our most 100 most threatened plants. It's absolutely spectacular. Its name comes from its bright uh, pink flower spots, which are tipped in green. And so they look like matchsticks and they're only about four centimeters across, but they are absolutely a work of art. They, they grow down in the southwest of, of Australia near Perth. And there's only about 500 of the plants left in the wild at, at about 11 different sites. It occurs now at only at about 7% of its former range. A lot of that area has been cleared for, for agriculture um, over the last couple of hundred years. So um, there's not many left. And um, it's, it, it's now got threats like um, threat, threatened from weed invasion, from, from rabbits. Rabbits are a real problem in Australia. Also from uh, Phytophthora, a disease that can cause dieback, and also from inappropriate fire. This is a species that needs fire to, um, for its seeds to germinate. And if the fire comes too frequently, then the plants can't set seed and we, we lose that seed bank and that population can't regenerate. So we, um, this is one of the species that we're trying to reverse the red for and try to improve its trajectory. So we're doing things like um, protecting sites from, from weeds and rabbits and disease. Um, we're trying some translocations, moving plants to different places in the landscape, try to spread the risk around and also collecting seeds for seed banking. So these are some of the things that, that we're trying to do for this plant. So I chose this, um, I chose this plant because it's an absolutely a work of art and I, it's like a sculpture by nature really. It's absolutely um, magnificent and it's actually inspired um, a whole whole range of artists to paint this plant. And it's even made its way onto a, an Australian postage stamp at one point. So people do think it's pretty special. Um, but plants aren't just important for themselves. They're obviously, um, they're, the, they're the backbone of our ecosystems. I'd say that as a plant scientist, I'd probably have a soil scientist who disagree with me. Um, and these banksias, these are part of the Proteaceae family. So they have these um, cluster roots that can mobilize um, mineral, mineral phosphorus in the soil. So they're really important for bringing nutrients into the ecosystem, which supports, you know, a whole range of life. So that's why I chose the matchstick banksia. Thank you, Sally. And Arit's going to flash up for us what the audience were putting up as their favorite species as we were going along. Um, so here we go, we're gonna see Pangolins do really well. We found that last seminar as well. Some gibbons, pygmy hippo is a nice choice. And then what I love about these pictures is how many different species we love. You know, we're not a, a uniform that we all love just one species. I'm delighted that somebody's put a, a fungi in. There's a couple of fungi that have made it this week, which is fantastic. Yes, shout out to Kira who's having the same observation because we get excited when we see fungi in. Um, but such a, a wonderful spread of different animals. Now I'm sure as you were all watching your slides coming up on each other's, the other part we would notice is that generally species are battling. 
much as we love animals, it's no guarantee that they're going to be safe just because we like them and we think they're amazing. And so in the last panel and in this panel, we asked a question of, well, what's going wrong? You know, here we have amazing talent, smart people working really hard right around the globe, yet the trends keep going in the wrong direction. When we consider things like amphibians, 41% are now listed as endangered, reef corals, 33%, sharks and rays, 30%. It really doesn't matter what we turn our minds to, the endangered species list just keeps getting worse. And so we asked the question as well, what's just not working? What is the main thing that's not working at a global level? And again, again, for those of you in the audience, there's a link that you're gonna be able to follow. But what we pulled up for the panelists to get you thinking, and some of you have really touched on it because we can answer this question when we think at a species level, then we become very specific about what the problems are for that species. But if we think of ourselves as a, an army of conservationists, what's not working at the global level? And, and so we have some of the answers from the last panel to get you thinking. But this time around, Gladys, starting with you, if you have to think and challenge us as a community of conservationists, what are the really big problems that we have to tackle? Oh, thank you, Jenny. Um, I feel that all of those, as you've listed, are quite big problems. But starting from, you know, we need to have more political will from government who need to see conservation as a priority. Um, and I think a lot of this is we need to build the capacity of the local people from where these species are found in conservation. So we, become, we have more local conservation leaders on the ground who can eventually have a lot of influence in society. Some of them can even become members of parliament and that will make a big deal at that level. Um, but right down to the communities, we have to engage them, make them become champions of conservation because without their will, the wildlife is not going to exist or survive. And we need to also link up with other um, disciplines because if you see there's human population growth, you know, you need to link up with the health sector to see how to promote family planning around protected areas in a way that does not destroy the environment, but promotes it, such as the integrated population health and environment approaches. We need to find alternative livelihoods for communities so that they can actually survive outside the forest. I'm, I'm going to uh, pitch Gorilla Conservation Coffee <laughs> because as well as tourism being, being a very viable alternative livelihood, but you can also create eco-friendly products such as you know supporting farmers around protected areas so that they also don't need to poach to survive and find markets for them not only locally but in other countries and yeah we need to look at all of that and educating the youth and the children because they'll influence their parents and grandparents and they're the future of tomorrow so that we start to respect nature and COVID-19 has been a very good indicator of the importance of needing to respect nature again. Thank you, Gladys. I think you're really pushing this along. Melanie, listening to Gladys and, and looking at those, what are the other big trends? What are the things that keep you awake at night? Ah, uh, well, and, and again, speaking for the fish, because not enough people are speaking for the fish at the moment. Um, I mean, I think part of the problem is you know, that often we can't, we, we can't see, you know, we have a saying, you know, there's plenty more fish in the sea. Well, well, well there aren't. Um, but we can't see how, how much they've been depleted. Um, we sort of think of it as an endless resource. And of course, fishing, the industry is, is immensely important. Economically, it's very important to countries, you know, to, to, to national governments. And of course, the protein of wild fish is, is a very important for many, for people as well. But we just, I think, don't realize how unsustainable so much of what we're doing is. Um, fish are so often treated, you know, just like, like sort of like livestock, but the, the wildlife, and I don't think that's appreciated. And, um, you know, and we have these you know, terribly unsustainable subsidies um, on fishing a lot of species. And it's, it's a difficult one to overcome because of the economics. But, um, you know, I think the more we can educate people, um, about the situation, the better. 
Well, John, do you want to pick up on economics and how that's not driving us in the right direction? Or John, where would you take this discussion on big threats? Well, you know, I think I think uh, the loss of species, in a sense, is a, you know a, a fundamental symptom of our of the breakdown or the relationship that we have with nature. Um, you know, and I think there's probably no single cause out there. Um, you know, there's there's many localized threats to species: um, overharvest, habitat conversion, isolation. There's regional things like diseases and fires, and there's global threats like climate change. Um, um, uh, pollution issues of one kind or another. And so there isn't really, you know, a single silver bullet to, to enable us to kind of deal with um, um, the challenges of loss of species. But if there was um, a fundamental issue, I would say it's that we are no longer maintaining the ecological integrity of the ecosystems in which we live. Um, and, you know, we do have ways to address that, and I'll keep this at a fairly high level. You know, we, we do know that area-based conservation works. We know that parks and protected areas work. We know that the persistence of species is linked to the size and connectivity of protected areas into the greater landscape in which they're living. Um, and we also know, um, um, as Melanie was saying, that, that there really needs to be a global commitment to protect biodiversity and, and natural ecosystems. Um, and there is the beginnings of that um, in the policy arena. Um, um, and actually, I'm, I'm somewhat optimistic that, um, that biodiversity is becoming more of a central issue and a recognition that as we lose biodiversity, we're really threatening the very planet in which we live. And so species are the integral part of all of that. So how do, we, how do we link species, which are very tangible, to the broad global commitments? I think that's the real challenge that we're facing. Yeah, it really is. And, and Brighton, I'm going to bring you into the discussion here around these big challenges. And, and from your point of view and, and, and how you see the world, what, do, what are you thinking is the big challenges? Thanks, Jenny. And just speaking up from John, I have come to equally realize that conservation for some time has been separated from people. So there seems to be this uh, huge gulf between conservation efforts and human prosperity and human existence. But we also re realize that the high rates of our diversity loss and species decline is happening in parts of the world with the highest rates of poverty. So bridging this gap that exists between conservation efforts and reducing human suffering and poverty is quite critical. And I think that's an area in which we are not concentrating much of our efforts as conservationists. But I've also realized that there's an important stakeholder, a critical stakeholder that is not always involved in the, con in the conversation of conservation. And that's the young people. If we have to see the level of transformation in this space, I believe we need to also in include women and young people, especially young people in developing countries, but also young people in, de in, in developed countries, because these are the people who are going to be around for the next, for the next, for the immediate future to oversee some of this work. So creating that intergenerational sort of collaboration between the young people, the elderly, uh, and having that cross-pollination of ideas is going to be critical. But I think moving forward, as we start thinking about long-term critical interventions, we need to start thinking about approaches that bridge this gap between people and nature and explore ways through which both can live in harmony. Thank you. That's, that's wonderful. And, and Sally, from your point of view, you have a unique role watching what happens. Yeah, thanks, Jenny. I, I think I echo a lot of the, the comments that a lot of this panelists have made about a real challenge being um, connecting people with nature and um, increasing the value of nature um, with, with the community. Um, because if the community values nature and can cares for nature, then, then the policies and the incentives flow from that. Um, it was interesting after we had devastating bushfires over the last summer in Australia, 
and we really saw um, an outpouring of concern from the Australian community, but also the international community uh, for the wildlife that was lost in that fire. Um, so I think there's, there is a real opportunity, I think, in Australia now to um, build on that sort of level of concern that, um, that was shown after these fires and, and um, you know, talk to people about what we stand, stand to lose um, more. So I think some of the other issues are, you know, creating the right incentives for conservation on, on private land. Um, the protected area network is fantastic and is really um, can be the backbone of conservation efforts. But um, a lot of our threatened species occur on private land. And I think there's, a, there's real room to provide incentives for that con conservation on private land. And one of the other challenges we have in Australia is sh the sheer size, <laughs> the sheer size of our continent and um, the scale of some of some of the threats and, and the fact that we don't have all the tools in the toolbox yet to manage them. We have feral cats that um, occur across 99.9% .9 of Australia and kill a million birds a day. And um, we don't really have um, large scale tools yet that we can use to control these sorts of invasive pests. So um, new tools, new incentives, and it trying to enhance that community value, I think. I I really love talking to conservationists because I try to keep you all to what the problem is and you all talk about hope and solutions. It's a really good character trait that I think we all share is this hopefulness of a better future. And, and so to explore a bit where hope comes from, because we probably just as diverse as our love of species is where we get our inspiration. And Melanie, I'm going to start with you this time in terms of governments coming together can actually make a difference. It's essential for the work that you're doing on migratory species. Do, do you get hope from that? I'm hoping now that it doesn't go down a, another dark rabbit hole, but where do you get your hope from, Melanie? Um, well, well, even before I get to the governments, I mean, I would just say right now that, um, you know, this year, I think, has actually been a, a great opportunity for hope. You know, during the, the, lock, the early lockdown, and for many of us, the second lockdown, um, you know, people have been reconnecting with nature and, you know, whether it's just noticing the bird life in their back gardens or, or being able to see, you know, the Himalayas from, from northern Indian cities or Mount Kilimanjaro from Nairobi or whatever it is, you know, suddenly people are like, oh, wow, you know, and, you know, we often talk about shifting baselines and sort of not realizing what we've lost, but I think this year we actually realized um, some of what we're in danger of losing if we, if we don't act. And so I think that's actually um, a, good, a good thing in itself and helps to reconnect people back to nature. But with governments, I think also, yes, you know, in CMS, I think we have a lot of success with bringing governments together, um, you know, and finding common ground and finding the things that they can work on. And, you know, some issues are very political and they don't always want to touch everything, but you can always find something um, that, that can be agreed and can be worked on to move, you know, to move the conservation of a species a little bit forward maybe the management of the species in a slightly more sustainable way. And yeah, so, you know, I, I actually see some quite good progress being made sometimes, yeah. Brighton, I'm sure you're a hopeful person. I can see it in you. Where do you draw your strength and hope from? Um, uh, thank you so much for that, for that question. And just picking up from uh, the previous remarks, I, I draw a lot of my inspiration from quite a number of things. Um, first of all, uh, I draw a lot of inspiration from human ingenuity and human determination to be able to soldier on irrespective of the insurmountable challenges. And I would like to first of all point to the COVID-19. When the COVID-19 hit, I was just finishing grad school at Columbia and the president sent an email indicating that we were going to be having virtual classes. And I started seeing it progress from a couple of cases to over a million cases. But just the determination that I saw in people and the hope is something that motivates me immensely. And I always take this into the conservation space. Uh, as somebody that was raised in a small peri-urban community in Zambia, and understanding what it meant, sometimes working an extra mile when there are droughts and, and, and um, staying at home when the bridge is washed away, connecting your house to the school. I saw a lot of hope and uh, determination in the people, which also spelled into the way they 
carry themselves, but also in the way they see challenges. Um, in the current crisis, I see a lot of hope in young people. When I see huge movements from Fridays for the Future and many other movements from around the world uh, front-loading conservation and taking it personal because our lives depend on it. So it's seeing those things that really motivate, motivates me and reminds me that it's possible if all of us can consider the current loss of biodiversity, the current climate crisis as a crisis. And if we see it as a crisis, then there's that sense of agency. So it's from, I, I, I would sum up to say, I get a lot of inspiration when I see people that are genuinely working tirelessly to safeguard the future of our planet, but also people that are leaving their ego outside of the door when they start discussing these critical issues, because these are issues that are about the future. They, they, they are issues that are about, uh, they, they're a matter of life and survival and they should be taken with utmost seriousness. Thank you. Sally, your inspiration, where does that come from? Oh, I think it comes from the people you meet on this journey. And I'm so lucky in this job to meet small community groups, um, you know, friends of local parks and reserves or um, land care groups that are looking after a patch or a species. And they just have such passion such knowledge about their species um, and, and willing to dedicate their, their, their weekends and their own time to, to saving a species. And um, every time when I get, um, I guess, despondent about the statistics and um, the number of species growing on, on these lists, um, going out and seeing people and meeting people working on the ground um, gives, gives me great comfort and hope for us being able to reverse the red. Gladys? How, anything you'd like to add to that, where your inspiration comes from? Um, it's very similar to what Brighton and everybody else is saying. Just seeing how people are changing and wanting to become champions to protect the wildlife. Even the most poor people, most impoverished can care about wildlife. You know, we're seeing here, you know, like the Batwa or the really poor communities saying, you know, we want to visit the gorillas as tourists. And that gives me a lot of hope, seeing people changing and wanting to protect the wildlife. But something else that has given me a lot of hope is the fact that the mountain gorilla species, which I've been working with for many years, is actually increasing in number. You know, it's almost doubled since over the past 25 years, which is amazing. And even during the pandemic, we've had a baby boom. <laughs> we've had like seven gorillas, baby gorillas born in the space of eight weeks which is very nice. It's very nice that in spite of whatever's going on around us, there's hope that the animals are getting on with their lives. If we leave them alone, they'll keep, they'll keep getting on. We don't know whether it's the lack of tourism that has enabled them to, you know, to relax and maybe carry their babies to charm or whatever it is. But there's actually a baby boom all over Africa, not only gorillas, but elephants and everywhere. So once you respect nature and give it a chance, it bounces back. And that gives me a lot of hope. That's wonderful. And you're right, the hopeful stories and, and really part of Reverse the Red is wanting to share these stories of hope is actually we can change this. We can change these trajectories and we have. Um, John, your, um, where you draw your hope from. Well, what, what Gladys was just talking about, I think is, is, is incredibly powerful because we recognize that there's a lot of species that are in danger of extinction. At the same time, um, species are not going extinct at the rates that we thought they might be. And that's because conservationists are actually doing things effectively. And conservation works. Um, and the, you know, what Gladys is talking about in terms of gorillas gives you um, a lot of hope about the resilience of the natural world. Um, and then, then the flip side of that, again, is the inspiration that we get from our conservation community and from everyone who is, who is involved in this endeavor. And I think, I think um, um, as, as Melanie was saying, the COVID issues, while it was a huge tragedy, while it is a huge tragedy, um, it also gives one hope that there is an opportunity to kind of build back better. Um, 
that that we can sort of step back and 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 ask how can we reestablish a better relationship with with nature um, and there's so much really fascinating thinking going on around economics around job creation um, and also a recognition that we have some huge challenges like um, the loss of tourism and the loss of revenues for conservation um, in places like like Africa so there's challenges but at the same time COVID does push us back into the resilience of us as people how do we how do we really affect this how do we do it in a better way and that's always a, a, a reason for hope I, I think that's just tremendous and and I'm loving Gladys your input that maybe COVID gave the year the the world a break for a year and, and in that space, the rest of the species got a chance to, to breathe while we all stayed home. At, at Reverse the Red, we're really reflecting that success comes from people working together. Instead of the fragmentation of conservation organizations, this real coming together of different organizations using science-based planning approaches and a methodology of, of assess, plan, and act, and then keep going through that cycle to assess again and plan again and act again. And it's still really early days, but we're starting to bring together people working within pilot countries, um, conservationists, zoos, universities, botanic gardens, museums, aquariums, all working together for this global species and, and pulling together ultimately a global species congress. But now I'd like you, 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 you got worried, you got hopeful, and now I'm going to make you all powerful. And, and so this is probably my favorite question where I say to our panelists, if you were all powerful, if you could do anything, what change would you like to see? Um, and I'm going to start with you, John, if you were all powerful, what would you be changing in our world? Well, I'll take you at, at your word here and say, okay, you gave me the, the opportunity to be all powerful. So let me be all powerful. You know, again, um, one, of the, one of the real challenges that we have in conservation is that most, if not all, of the dominant modern cultures, we see ourselves as apart from nature, not a part of nature. Uh, nature is to be used, to be subjugated, to be exploited. Um, and our economic systems, in no small measure, depend on the harvest of natural resources and our indicators of success is perpetual growth rather than, rather than sustainability. Um, and we take it for granted that there will always be a subsidy from nature. Um, and so if I, indeed I was all powerful, I would really change the way we humans think about our relationship with nature and establish sustainability in everything that we do. There are cultures, especially traditional cultures, where that is more preeminent than in our dominant um, Western cultures. Um, and so there are, there are lessons to be learned, but we do need to fundamentally change the way we relate to nature. Um, and if I was powerful, I would make it happen that way. Thank you, John. Now I'm a little worried, but Sally, if you were all powerful, uh, what would you be changing? <laughs> Well, I, I think it relates to what John was saying, but I think having a, a much stronger um, voice and ability for um, Indigenous history and um, ecological knowledge to, um, to manage our landscape. Uh, Indigenous Australians have managed our landscape um, for 60,000 years using traditional fire and a whole range of techniques and um, bringing that to the fore in Australia and empowering Indigenous Australians to um, practice uh, land management and to teach the rest of us um, how, to, how to manage this um, beautiful landscape, I think would be one thing I'd really like to see change. Brighton, you're all powerful. What are you changing? Uh, if I add a magic wand, I think the most critical acupunctures I would most importantly uh, touch on uh, would be uh, creating um, a platform that could mobilize B 
billions of people, especially young people from around the world to rally behind the cause of conservation, but also change how we communicate about um, conservation and, and the climate crisis. I believe there's been a very huge language barrier which even prevents people from really coming on this bandwagon. So I would really change and turn our communication in a way that non-scientists can understand. And I believe it's only by changing that form of communication in the way that we speak about these issues that can bring in even those that might be very um, uh, risk averse or deny the existence of some of the challenges that we are speaking about. So I, I would, to some degree, flip how we communicate and communicate in a language that more non-scientists understand that way we can build a collision of young people we can build a collision of non-scientists that can work with us in the conservation space i love that a new language that would be awesome uh, melanie what are you changing with all this well with brighton's magic wand well um the magic wand is, I mean, I think he's absolutely right. And, you know, motivating the young people, giving them new language. And I mean, if I had a magic wand, you know, I would like to take everybody to see the mountain gorillas with Gladys or to see the sharks and the Galapagos sitting here behind me. Um, of course, without a magic wand, that's not going to be but so possible. But, you know, if only, if, but, but of course, there are also virtual ways of doing that. Um, uh, these days, but just to let people really see the majesty of nature so that they they understand, you know, because we, we are all working in this area all the time, we understand, but to bring in other people who really don't know, to let them understand, you know, what it is about nature that is so important if for, for their own lives even, um, so that they can also be part of the solution. Thank you, Melanie. And I think, Gladys, we would all love to be with you visiting your gorillas. That's, that's my favorite idea so far. But Gladys, what would you do if you were all powerful? Um, I'm quite ambitious, I would say, if I was all powerful. But one thing I think that is really missing in conservation is we don't have enough women leaders in conservation, um, especially in the developing world, but even in the developed world. And, you know, women have a different style of leadership from men and it's more collaborative. And in conservation, we need people to collaborate. The challenges are too immense that it's not about competition. It's not going to get us to where we need to go. We need to be more collaborative and holistic. And we just need more women voices up there in, you know, the top positions as well. That's very important. And I think it's possible, but uh, that's something I'd love to see. And something else is, you know, which the pandemic has shown, we need to incorporate healthcare in conservation a lot more. That means reaching out to other sectors. As Melanie mentioned, get everybody to support conservation. Um, you know, the health sector, development sector, agriculture sector, reach out to other sectors so that we're able to address all these issues because they all affect conservation in one way or another. Thank you, Gladys. You're getting a lot of cheers through the chat stream. A lot of the women out there cheering. Now, John, it might not be the most powerful position in the world, but you are standing to become president of the IUCN. Um, and, and I'd love to give you the, the spotlight for a few minutes just to talk a little bit about your vision for the role of the IUCN and, and the, what you would be doing in the next term. Thanks, Jenny. Um, um, you know, IUCN may not be the most powerful position in the world, um, but it really does have a lot of influence. And it has a lot of influence because it's got this very, very diverse membership of governments and NGOs. Um, and the power of IUCN really derives from that diversity. Um, I think, you know, in the last few years, um, uh, we've lost some authority in IUCN, though. We've, um, um, the discussion has become more polarized, political consideration and scientific knowledge get confused. And so, so, so we're no longer the, the, the go-to organization. 
So um, without getting into too much detail, um, to strengthen its authority and mandate, one of the things that I would do would be to um, try to make sure that IUCN acts more like a union. We actually need to forge a much stronger consensus between members, commissions, and programs. We need to strengthen the governance of the union. And we need to establish mechanisms so that members, governments, and NGOs um, can really come together more than just at that Congress every four years. Um, we need to ensure that the activities of IUCN's regional programs align with the priority of mem priorities of members. Um, and we need to shift the focus of the secretariat so that um, it becomes um, more of a service provider to members. We need to open up um, the influence of IUCN to multilateral and bilateral funders. And indeed, we actually need to shift the whole financial model of IUCN. So there is that element of the union. We also need to strengthen um, IUCN's capacity in scientific knowledge and information. We need to integrate the commissions much more into the business of IUCN. Commissions are frequently just seen as sort of technical and scientific experts, not as conservation stakeholders in their own rights. And we need to develop much more of an internal financial support for our commissions. Um, as we've heard from other um, members today or other panelists today, we need to open up IUCN to con new constituencies, including uh, youth and indigenous cultures. And we need to open up the, the knowledge base for conservation, um, um, including getting into nature-based solutions, depending on traditional knowledge um, and the like. You know, I have, I have um, a lot of experience with IUCN. Um, I've got a deep knowledge of the organization. Um, for the last eight years, I've been a vice president of council and the regional counselor for North America and the Caribbean. Um, but I've been active in IUCN since 1985 when I joined the SSC. And I served on its steering committee between 1991 and 2010. So I understand the organization of IUCN, understand its processes, its challenges, um, and um, I look forward to making a difference with the organization. So thank you, Jenny. Thank you, John. We, at Reverse the Red, our next step was going to be that we were going to be, well, it still is, that we will launch the movement at the IUCN World Conservation Congress. And I would love to invite all of you, our panel and everyone else out there to be joining us when we meet in Marseille eventually for a glass of wine in the pavilion. The next step as well is to build national capacity. So we're looking to work with about 12 pilot countries where we will be strengthening the capacity to assess, plan and act using the methodology that's been tried and tested and that so many of the members talking about success have started to talk about. We have a live website that is now being launched which includes stories of success where we're looking at where organizations and, and, and partners have used the Assess Plan Act methodology and come about giving um, outcomes that are even stronger and positive, just like Gladys was, was talking about. And we're building our global partnership towards Global Species Congress. We don't have all the answers, but we're certainly optimistic, willing, and gonna give it a good go. And I'd like to do a shout out to all of our conservation partners through the pavilion. Um, really all of the organizations that put up their hand to be part of Reverse the Red as we started out with just a dream. And we're gonna be inviting all of you to join us as that becomes so much more. Now, one of the problems with these is the time goes so quickly. I can't believe we're getting towards the end of the time already. And so I'm gonna give you each like five seconds, just really quickly um, to say, a last final word on, on what you're looking forward to doing to reverse the red. And I'll start this time with you, Gladys. So if we can be really quick, because I have completely run out of time, but I'd love to give you each a last word on how you're going to help us reverse the trends for species. Thank you very much. Um, I would say that, uh, I only have five seconds, <laughs> but I think it's important to all work together um, in many ways to reverse the red. I mean, just during COVID-19, all the conservation partners here at Bwindi, where I'm actually speaking from, Bwindi Penchopo National Park, 
we have been able to get together to see how to reduce the impact of COVID-19 on the mountain gorillas. And I think there should be much more collaboration amongst all of us. Thanks, Gladys. Brighton, your 30 seconds. To be able to reverse the red. Thank you, Gladys. Brighton. Uh, thank you so much, Jenny. I think it's been a very engaging conversation. Um, uh, for me, my commitment is mobilizing young people, and I see myself playing a critical role in sharing my experience, uh, sharing my scholarship, but also sharing some of the strategies I believe would be critical in reversing the red. I believe if young people can be empowered to think about business ideas beyond um, nature itself, or business ideas that promote sustainability, we can create a lot of positive ripple effect. And I see myself uh, playing a critical role in that space. Thank you. Thank you, Bryson. Melanie. Yes. Um, well, you know, some of us are lucky that we actually get to work on this all the time, as, as I think most of the panelists do. And I mean, I just think to keep on doing what we're doing, to keep redoubling our efforts, to keep working with our partners. You know, you had a list of partners up on the screen a minute ago. I mean, in CMS, we have fantastic partners, both NGOs and the other conventions and IUCN who we work with. And oh, if there were just more hours in the day, um, we could get even more done. Thank you, Thanks. Sally. And Sally. Well, we're at a, I guess, an exciting point where we're developing a new threatened species, developing a new threatened species strategy in Australia. We've had one for the last five years. Um, we're going to try and learn some lessons from the last one um, and develop a new one. And our objective is to try to improve the trajectories of our of our species. So um, we hope that that'll contribute to reversing the red in Australia. And John, in thirty seconds, how you're going to reverse the red? I'll, I'll echo what the other panelists have said, um, but maybe I'll emphasize as well that um, you know, as we look at species conservation, one approach does not fit all. Um, we, we have to use knowledge and science to inform pragmatic action around species. Different species have got different challenges um, and we need to understand the context, develop pragmatic solutions to each individual challenge um, and we can really affect um, species conservation and reverse the red. Thank you. And please join me in thanking this amazing panel. I was looking forward to a profound conversation and we've certainly had that. Um, I absolutely love the answers and so many great insights that each of you have brought to the, this discussion. And I want to remind everyone that we are actually all powerful. We are all consumers. We're all voters. We're all citizens. We all have a voice and we can all use that voice whenever we get a chance. And so to use your voice and to use your choices to make an impact for species wherever you can is really my biggest encouragement to everyone. You can ask politicians what they're going to do to reverse the red. And so I'm going to leave you all with a final quote that'll come up on the slide that ends, ends where it started with Wangari Matai. I'm sure I'm massacring that. She says, there comes a time when humanity is called to shift to a new level of consciousness. And that time is now. And I think we all agree with it. The time is now, we can make a difference. And if we all join together, we definitely can reverse the red. Thank you to the amazing panel. It's been a real joy to spend the last hour with you. I'm sorry we didn't have two hours, but we must do it again in the, the not too distant future. Thank you all very much. Thank you all. Thank you, Jenny. Thank you very much, Jenny and all the panelists, Melanie and everyone. <laughs> nice to see you again. Yes, <laughs> indeed. <laughs> Wish we were in Burundi. <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you all. Yeah, <laughs> after the lockdown. <laughs> <laughs> that they will lift it at one point and we can get back yes <laughs> the global lockdown <laughs> thank you everybody for joining us and we're gonna say goodbye <laughs>